Right, and good morning. My name is Chaplain Tony Check. I'm the Fort Wayne Wright Community Pastor for those of you coming in via live stream. Uh, quick question for y'all as we get going into today's training. What are some life events that individuals, families, soldiers, civilians, what are some life events we have to get ready for? Deployment. Deployment. FTXs. Childbirth. Childbirth. Huge need to get ready for that, right? Been through four of them, didn't think they were that bad. My wife wanted to get ready for those stuff. So, yes. Marriage. Marriage. Awesome. Divorce. Both of <laughs> Wow. That's why we get ready for marriage, so that we don't go to the second one. Yeah, much better. Pandemics. Pandemics. <laughs> yeah. Right? I, just, but there's, I mean, there is something to that, right? We get ready for pandemics, disasters. We prep, right? Who's a prepper in here? Any preppers? Got a, prep, a couple of preppers. All right, what else? PCS. PCS, we get ready for it, don't we? Spend a lot of time getting ready for that move, only to have the rug pulled out from underneath us, for some of us, all right? What else? What other? ETS. Yeah. <laughs> How about retirement, right? Yeah. Get ready for that. Did, somebody said death. All right. College. All sorts of things that we end up trying to get ready for in life that we have to navigate, right? So what are some of the impacts of not being prepared for these life events? <laughs> Financial extremes, right? <laughs> stress. How much stress? <laughs> Tons of stress. Go on a deployment and don't have a power of attorney for your wife, right? Or for your family member staying at home. How, how much stress is there in that? Well, some other, some other impacts for not being prepared. <laughs> Financial hardship, right? Okay. Some of the things on that list, like divorce or death. If you're not prepared. Divorce or death, yeah, big time, right? So this morning, we are going to talk about one of Army Material Command's, uh, one of the CG's priorities and strategic support areas of focus, which happens to be service members, civilian, and family readiness, right? So... Uh, what we're going to do with this is a couple different things. One of them is it's going to be very heavy on doctrine, right? Uh, and I'm going to give you the why up front. The why up front is because these are things that our branch has written, right? It's defined in our regulation. It's defined in our training manuals and training guidance. It's the thing that our branch wants to communicate, not only with us, who are out in the trenches doing the work in the ministry, right? But it's something that they want to also communicate across the rest of the army. They want the rest of the army to know something in the lines of readiness for us. So we're going to talk about a whole bunch of doctrine. And then the second half of this is we're going to talk about planning and integration. And what I'm going to do is, is uh, I just want you to know on I'm, I'm this first one, uh, you see this task number on that. That is not the actual task number for readiness. That's actually spiritual fitness task net number, right? Uh, there is no direct corresponding task in the Army that says plan readiness events for chaplains. Instead, you're going to see in just a little while some of those areas that we break it down into. All right. Uh, Sergeant Daffron wanted to joke this morning, so uh, under no circumstances is this training supposed to be conducted in my gear this morning. <laughs> right? Thanks. I appreciate you laughing. So, uh, some of the references up here that I'm going to be walking through this morning, uh, not all of them 
but a good chunk of them are, you're going to actually see up there on the screen and we're going to take the time to, to read through those things a little bit, as exciting as that is. Uh, and then some of the other things, vision statement, uh, I will send this out, this is an older one. I thought I had a newer one uh, that talked about soldier, civilian, and family readiness. I've got to dig it up and see if I can find it. They don't have it posted uh, under memorandums and those types of things on Army Publishing yet. So, uh, and then the chaplain course journal, right? So let's shift a little bit. Another set of questions up here. What kind of meetings exercises, events have you been to organize, participated in? Think about your units, right? Since you've been in the military, as a battalion or a brigade baba, or even garrison, what are some of the events that you have participated in that have been concerned about readiness? BHPT. What is it? BHPT. BHPT? Uh, Promotion Council, yeah, that's the right? So the Brigade Health Council meeting. Okay, what else? Newcomers brief. Newcomers brief. What's the purpose in that? How does that help you get ready? Oh yeah, when the soldiers arrive, I'm supposed to put some down. Sure, get some squared up. Where do I go for CIF? You know, what are their hours of operation? Uh, what's my training status? They're typically going to do MRT training. They're going to do a little bit of shark training, EO training. Uh, they're going to do ACE training, right? Some of the things that we do here at post to help soldiers get what? Ready, right? All right. What are some other meetings, exercises, events that you guys have been to or participated well, in? Here, the quality of life working groups. Okay, and what do they do at those? Yeah, they help to improve the quality of life so soldiers can be more resilient and ready. Okay. Strong bonds. Strong bonds. How does that help? How many marriages make up the soldiers? You got it, right? If, if the family's not in good health, then that soldier's going to have all sorts of problems and struggles and trials. If you've ever gone on a deployment or been in an FTX, what happens when you have soldiers who have a marriage falling apart at home? They go home. They, they, they go home. They maybe go home early, right? So somebody had one back there. <laughs> FTXs. Okay. How do those help us get ready? I think it, uh, so it gets you on a mission. It helps you uh, actually be able to do that before. But it also gives your family back home in case it's not happening there. So if you get them ready, you do not need that kind of as well. Okay, so it may prepare them for what could come for an extended period of time, right? Command and staff. Command and staff. How does that help with readiness? It gives the chance raising opportunity for the commander to communicate the different things that are going on with the unit um, at least once a week, once a month, where they be, um, whether in so what has happened to the best one, what's happened to the chaplain, like what all of us are going to bring to the table. Okay. So typically you have schools talk at those, right? Who's pending school, who needs school, retention. what schools are coming up. You have retention so that the unit can track what's overall readiness, right? What's the strength, right? S1's going to talk about who's coming, who's going, what's the strength of the force, right? All about readiness in some way, shape, or form. Any other ones that you can think of? Big, little? PT? Okay. Chapel services. Okay. Spiritual fitness enhances spiritual fitness. It does, doesn't it? The, the spiritual fitness component. You, you have. No, I was saying that. I, I, was, I was saying that. I, I, Okay, let me, let me 
this way. Uh, NWR train, um, trips, trains, kind of trips. NWR. NWR trips. Trips, yeah. Okay. They kind of help, help enjoy life a little bit, right? Sure, we can put that on there. I thought somebody said UMT training. UMT. You said UMT training, right? So how does that help us get ready? Uh oh, that's where we are right now. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, we talk about issues and concerns, right? That will really help or hinder us from doing our job. <laughs> like, like operating in a pluralistic environment, yeah. right? For one thing. If we don't know how to do that, if, if we're rusty on that, if we're struggling with that, right? Maybe we're a brand new chaplain or, or a brand new religious affairs specialist coming. And so to sit through a training like this, it gets, them, it gets you ready to operate a little better, right? With a little more knowledge, a little more skill, a little more, why do I help other individuals who are very different faith groups from myself? Why do I help those individuals, right? So any other things you can think of? Gunther, go ahead. Spiritual PT. Okay. Uh, uh, clips. Clips. Tell us about clips. Connection, life, purpose, strategy, uh, training. So it's it's that uh, NCO led, junior officer led, sergeants kind of training that the chaplain and the UMT trains them. So we train the trainer. Okay. And it, it, it focuses on the sustainment of spiritual morale. Okay. Spiritual morale. Good. Dig it in. So, if you think about it, one of the things that you've probably come across sitting in any number of meetings is that your commanders are all concerned about what? Readiness. And hopefully one of the things you can kind of piece together is the fact that there are different pieces of readiness, right? So there's physical readiness, there's medical readiness, uh, there's training readiness, right? Why do we do gunneries and, and ranges and those types of things? Because we want to make sure that you're ready as a soldier to use your weapon systems, right? Uh, why do we do physical training and, and PT tests to make sure you're physically fit? and that you can meet a, a minimal standard to, to do your mission, right? Over and over and over again. Commanders are all concerned about readiness. So this is the IMCOM slides, right? Just take a second, you can kind of see some of their priorities, right? Some of the things they want people to know, this is what we're all about. And look at how those things end up tying into readiness, right? Priority family programs, programs and services designed to improve the readiness and resilience of Army families in order to allow soldiers to focus on their military occupation. So some of those offset things, right, like the strong bonds that you do, or the premarital counseling that you do with your soldiers, or other training events going on that are geared towards family, those directly impact those individuals, so end of day they can do what? Focus on the mission, right? Priority readiness, materials, equipment, all those types of things, right? Big push right now, uh, big buzzword is modernization of all of our equipment, right? Readiness, readiness, getting the new, the latest, the greatest, the best equipment that you possibly can. Soldier programs designed to improve readiness and resiliency, right? Those things, two buzzwords, seem to go hand in hand over and over again. Uh, priority support the training, priority infrastructure, right? All these things, as priorities going on, all feeding into this, making us a resilient and a ready army to do what it is that we have to do. So if, if anything is a takeaway today, one of the things you need to go away with is the fact that this is major. This is something that, that our commanders at every echelon are concerned about. Readiness in some way, shape, or form. And so what that ends up doing is if you have readiness issues as a unit, then that means you have minimal combat power. So if 
Gunther is worried about his new marriage failing. He's not ready. Why? Because his head isn't in training. His head isn't in employment. His head isn't in operating equipment safely. His head's in my readiness issue, my resiliency issue, my family problem, that thing going on in life, right? And so the other takeaway in this is that we as UMTs, one of our key functions is we assess components of unit, ready, of unit readiness and advise commanders on those readiness issues. And then we turn around as part of our CMRP, we tell them, hey sir, hey ma'am, these are things that are gonna help your soldiers in the area of readiness, okay? So why do you think civilians are out here? Why do, you think, why do you think when we talk about readiness, we talk about not only service members, right? And, and notice that terminology, it's a change. It's a shift. It's recognizing that we have service members from other branches, that most of our installations, that we've moved to many bases that are, are joint bases, right? So you may have Air Force and, and Army, you may have Marines and Army, you may have Navy and Army at a given installation. Uh, coming from Fort Leonard Wood, we had Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force running around all four branches. We even had Coasties running around, right? Um, so why do you think we talk about DA civilians being a part of this conversation? Because they are an integral part of the DOE. Huge part. Yeah. Any idea what percentage there were? I don't know. Okay. Look, look around, it's pretty huge, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I know the last installation I came from, there was one civilian for every soldier working on post, right? Huge percentage of our workforce. They provide continuity. What are some places you might find those civilians in your organizations? <laughs> our, our DRE, we got one, right? DA civilian? <laughs> Hospital, big time. Doctors, nurses, tech, tech support of all sorts, right? Maintenance, you name it. And the Gerson um, XO, XO is a DA civilian, right? Yeah, so sitting in our battalions, right, in our war fighting units, we don't see a lot of civilians. Seven hundred and seven civilians working. I post. Which is which is huge, right? You know how many US Army Air Force talking about seven hundred civilians and about twenty five There are actually posts that have stood up industrial chaplains for their civilians. Chaplain does not have a unit, his whole mission is the civilian. Okay. There you go, right? So they are interspersed in all of our units. So if you go to some of these types of units in particular, you're going to see more and more civilians as a part of it. And so I didn't want to take the I wanted to take the opportunity not to miss it, right? So let's talk about some of our doctrine, right? And and I know this is incredibly exciting. This is what's out there. So this is AR-165-1, and it talks about all commanders at Army Command, Army Service, Component Command, direct reporting unit level and below. Religious program for the Army is the commander's program, right? So when we talk about programs that we do as chaplains, it's our commander's program, right? And so you can see some of those things provide equitable support for religious, moral, and ethical activities of all personnel in your command, provide opportunity, time, facilities for free exercise of religion, accommodate special religious practices of personnel in your commands, ensure and resource the chaplain-led training program. So when we start planning readiness events, right, the funding instrument is our command for it. But look at what it says there on the very bottom. It says support chaplain-led programs that build and maintain individual and family readiness, resiliency, and moral well-being. That's our doctrine, 
right? That's army regulation. That's a mandate of what we do. Another one, right? So AR 165-1, paragraph 9, 9, 9, 9, 10, 616, it talks about moral leadership training, right? Being one of those things that can enhance readiness. What are some ways in which not having a morally fit unit impacts readiness? People can die. What are some other things? Get in, tru get in trouble and not be full strength. Not be in full strength because you're chaptering people left and right, right? If your leaders are morally unfit, they're definitely not taking the needs of their families and the, the, the moral responsibilities of their soldiers into context, which is going to immediately result in families that are not ready, they're not resilient, struggles there. 100%, right? It adversely affects the morale. It affects the morale, right? There's no trust. If, if morale is bad, if there's no trust because you have a morally deficient command, there, there's no trust, there's no cohesive teams that has second and third order effects on that unit, right? So, you know, and this is one of the things th that the chaplain corps has recognized. Think about in your unit in particular, right? How many meetings does your commander have with the JAG, right? On the brigade level, how many, how many meetings does your commander have with their subordinate commanders over moral leadership or, or moral failures within the units? It impacts readiness, right? So that's one of the areas you should tuck in the back of your head is in this area of moral leadership training and ethics, right? As, as areas where we as UMPs can impact readiness. And our doctrine says, whose lane is it? SARS, right? So you look down and it says in 910, it says many moral issues affect the lives of soldiers, civilians, families, impacting the effectiveness of service, command climate, unit readiness, and cohesion. And then it goes on, relationship resiliency training. Chaplain Corps provides training to individuals, couples, families to develop skills that enable relationship resiliency and therefore readiness. See again that direct link between being ready and resilient in the programs that we end up providing in the area of relationships, right? Um, field manual, right? So FM 105, new uh, manual, if you have not seen that, the latest edition of that came out in June of 2015. It also talks about uh, this area of readiness and resiliency and how we as UMTs, you look at the very last bit of it right there, right? And it says, chaplains and religious affairs specialists live out shared experiences of an army family, provide dedicated skills to what? Resolve conflict, foster faith, and enhance unit readiness and individual service members and family resiliency. So, summary of the, the FM 105-1, it says, religious support personnel assigned to formations in an army task with providing joint force, commanders operationally significant, and sustained land power must train, prepare, and assess individual and collective readiness to provide religious support, religious support to forces engaged across the range of military operations. Providing meaningful religious support to service members, families, and authorized civilians can occur under widely differing circumstances with rapid and unpredictable transitions, right? So again, what they're saying is that our job as UMTs is to have a piece in this conversation when it comes to unit readiness where we have to help train, we have to help prepare, we have to help assess individual and collective readiness of the force going on, right? And so what do we do? Our ATP says, to improve readiness, we do this thing called internal advisement. We have this conversation with our UMTs, we have this conversation with our, with our commands, about what they need within their command to help in this area of readiness.
One more, I'm going to just hit it right there so that you see it. It says family and personnel matters within units often significantly impact operations, mission accomplishment, and unit and individual readiness sufficient to justify internal advisement to Army leaders. And some examples they give from their that, that are areas where we can uh, advise on or that have impact are listed there underneath, right? And then of course, obviously, the religious support piece, we talk about spiritual fitness, is kind of the doctrinal shift of terms in there. It's religious support slash spiritual fitness of our soldiers, right? The religious component of it is something that they want you to see. So I want you guys to see something that the chief wrote, right? Will somebody read that for me? Jeremy Caldwell, the chief of staff of the Army, recently, recently reminded us that when our Army deploys, we don't go to participate or to try hard. We go to win. Winning matters. I couldn't agree more with Jeremy Caldwell. That's within our armies, non-negotiable uh, contract to fight and win our agents' wars is the Captain Corps' unique purpose. To build army spiritual readiness by caring for soldiers, their families, and army civilians across the full spectrum of the conflict. Our Corps does, <coughs> does this by being a world-class, fully integrated network of army religious support professionals who are known as their in air, that, and critical contributions to enhancing readiness. Then the army looks to us for spiritual uh, leadership and direction. No other branch is, is uh, charged with this all responsibility. So to Barney that down, right? To, to make it as basic as it can be, is our chief is saying that. We're supposed to be top-notch religious support professionals, right? Integrated into the network of Army religious support professionals, fully integrated, right? So fully integrated within our units, within our commands, within our garrisons, all those things, so that we are known at the end of the day for contributing something to this area of readiness, right? He's saying, this is our fight. That's what he expects. That's our mission. So, uh, one more area, right? Some of you have maybe seen something like this in your units before. Have you ever seen the lines of efforts for your units? Maybe you do this in the context of a uh, metal briefing or kind of a state of the union, state of the organization type brief that typically a battalion, that company commanders will do battalion commander, battalion commander will turn around and do to brigade commander, brigade commanders will turn around and do this to a division commander or CG, right? Again, this whole area, this is from a couple years ago, but soldier, civilian, and family readiness, right? This is a priority of our commanders, again, over and over again, and I've seen these, this is uh, from the maneuvers, Center of Excellence in Benning, the one that we had at Fort Leonard Wood for the Maneuver Support Center of Excellence was just about the same. Uh, one of those things that's recently come to the forefront is this Maneuver Force Modernization, right? Uh, but a lot of it before that was this emphasis on training and developing leaders, right? Which isn't going to go around. So the bottom line, we need to understand that our commanders are concerned about readiness. Our doctrine says that we have a significant role in this area of service members, civilian and family readiness. And some of the ways in which we contribute to this is by marriage and family programming, moral leadership and ethics training, and then by our spiritual fitness plan, right? So let's go ahead and look at a task. Uh, I pulled out a task. This is actually the task on conduct spiritual fitness training. It's something that you can use to adapt in this area of, of readiness training, right? As you think about readiness training, one of the things you want to do is look overall what's the 
What's the program going to be? What is it that I'm going to pitch to my commander? And I know our last training was in the area of CMRP, right? And uh, having that ready, but this fits into it where we begin to look at nuts and bolts of individual programming, right? And so, uh, what are those steps, those performance steps? And I'm not going to read every one on here because you can look at it, but we want to determine the need, goals, and purpose of the event, and we want to assess the needs of that group. And they give us a couple of ways in which we're able to get what's the need. And the bottom line of that is talking to people in some way, shape, or form, whether it's written communication to figure out what it is that they need through a survey, or whether it's talking to people, or whether it's just walking around and looking at what's going on in a unit, what do your eyes tell you, or what do you perceive as areas where we need help in an organization, right? You develop goals for that, for that event, right? Uh, and that's based on your need assessment and something that you want to identify in your CMRP so that you communicate that with the command. That's that advisement piece, right? As you begin to put this, what is it that I want to accomplish? I want to make stronger families or I want to educate our leaders on uh, moral leadership. What's it look like to be a moral leader or, or proper workplace ethics or whatever it is that you're doing, spiritual fitness event, right? You wanna have goals for those events. You wanna establish a purpose for that event, right? Whatever it is, and again, uh, just some examples of what it might be, and you might substitute any one of those things in there for spiritual fitness event. You wanna talk to your command about money, right? Because at the end of the day, you need money for ministry or you have to get incredibly creative. And uh, so you can look at things like uh, sections of our regulation that talk about how chaplains can get funding for family programs, right? Command-sponsored chaplain-led programs is the basis for asking for money to do ministry in any way, shape, or form. We call it ministry, our units call it religious support. The Army terminology is religious support. And so we want to talk about money and see where is it that we can get the money from. Is it is it NAF on the NAF side? Is it on the AF side? Uh, who's, who can help us get that? Can, can the Garrison RSO help us get those funds? Or are we going to the commander going, sir, ma'am, give me money for this thing? Uh, next step is you want to schedule that event through the S3. So how many of you seen events sponsored by UMPs or organizations that did not go through command channels? How many times have you seen that? How, how have those events gone? Mostly not so. Mostly on the downhill slide, right? Oh, well, hey, chaplain, we've got a gunnery going on at the same time. Can you move that thing? Uh, hey, chaplain, no, we're actually going to be at, I, I remember, one of my fellow battalion chaplains, he planned something for his organization. His command told him, hey, chaplain, we're going to be in JRTC during that time. What are you doing? Go away, right? They need to integrate and talk to your S3 shop about coordinating the date, time, and location of the event, putting it on the training calendar, right? And then talking with those company commanders and first sergeants to deconflict and make sure that they're tracking those things, right? Uh, the next performance step that we're supposed to do is we're supposed to be talking to both our commander and our supervisory chaplain. Hey, sir. Hey, ma'am. This is what we're trying to do. This is the time frame of when we're doing it. This is what we're hoping to do it. Do I have green light to go ahead and still do it on this timetable? And the benefit of having that conversation is when I turn around and I ask that commander, hey, can you fund us? What do you think they're more likely to say? Yes. Right? So, but to take the time to put it on your grid that it's coming. We want to coordinate logistics support for that event, right? Uh, we want to publicize that event. Where should we publicize those events? As UMTs. What's the way to publicize those things? <clears throat> Probably the most important one, right, would be frag work. Why do we want to do frag work? <laughs> Uh, 
language the army speaks, why else? Because it's your authority to do it. It's the commander's order, right? That's what that frag order is. It's just your commander giving the bless off, go ahead and execute this training. It's on the schedule. Commands know that it's happening. And the frag order communicates to every subordinate command, this is the event that's going on, right? The more time that we give them, the more of a heads up that we give them, the better. Because then it can get publicized in that way. And then the other way to publicize that event, obviously through very informal means, mouth to mouth, flyers posted in different places, the barracks, the dining facility, uh, wherever you want to publicize those things in the public forum, right? And then you want to conduct that event, right? Whatever it is, uh, one of the performance steps they say is that as you go, not only uh, as you conduct that event, you should get interaction and feedback from the participants. Hey, how's the event going? Is this really meeting those needs? And then you follow that up with a formalized AAR, right? And uh, then you provide any follow-up pastoral care as needed. So I know that this seems incredibly simple when we think about it, right? Uh, we're sitting here going, Chaplain, really? We're having a con we're having a, a training seminar on soldier, civilian, and family readiness, and we just walked through how to do an event, right? So I'll remind you of our audience. We have soldiers in this organization that have never been in a battalion before, right? So this hits a need for them. For those of us who have been doing this for a minute, it reminds us of what right looks like. Right? Uh, to take the time to walk through the doctrine tells us what our branch expects of us and what our branch is communicating with other individuals across the Army, right? You're expecting that in some way, shape, or form, you're sharing these things with your commanders. And maybe your commander is actually reading that, some of that doctrine, right? And so uh, performance measures, we don't have to take the time to walk through those. Those will be in the slide deck that you get. But uh, if we were actually grading the conduct of a spiritual fitness training event or an event, some, some measures kind of as a quick, hey, what are some things that I should think about? So one thing I noticed is that uh, Dr. King got put in uh, before he left In that max. Yeah, yeah, it would be. So it's going to vary by command, yeah. right? So I, I've been in organizations where every training event, commander wants a risk assessment, yeah. commander wants risk assessments for PT that we conduct, right? Or that gets conducted on a, on a daily basis in their organization. And then some are going to go, yeah, no, we don't, we don't need that level of it, you know? Uh, but that may be something you want to think about. What are the risks? With COVID, probably now more than well, well, yeah, you know, I mean, so this environment, what are the risks of doing an, an event down in Anchorage? Yeah. I've got people driving six hours, seven hours to go to a training event. You, you know, what are, the, what are the risks? So people are tracking that that's a, a potential, right? Um, I'm gonna blow through these. I'm not gonna do these. As a reminder, uh, sometimes we need to think about other organizations that can help us in readiness, right? Like FAP, like ACS, like the financial money management folks uh, hired through ACS. Maybe behavioral health is somebody who can help us out. Combat stress control, if your unit has a suicide or, or an unexpected death, those are other organizations or groups that can help us in our fight against readiness, right? Um, that you need to maybe be aware of, hey, how, how can I partner with them? How can they help me? Or maybe this is just a huge need, I see it, and, and I recognize they've got a skill set 
that can scratch an edge in my unit, right? Uh, and it's still our lane. So quick check on, line, uh, on learning. What, why do we need to understand readiness from our commander's perspective? Readiness is their program. That's what they're all about. From SRPs to brigade health promotion councils to high risk soldier meetings to you name it. They're all about readiness, equipment readiness, personnel readiness, and our piece in that is that human dimension, right? Their, their spiritual readiness, uh, their relational healthiness, right? Uh, their moral and ethical foundation is part of what we do, right? Um, why care about it as a UMT? It's our lane. It's our lane. So, uh, any questions?